years ago in France, the novice master pulled out of his habit something that he had cut out for us to see. It was a very hairy looking hermit on a desert isle. This was a cartoon. And he looked somewhat distraught. And before him was appearing a very cogent looking demon, visible by his horns and little tail, presenting a gigantic cup or chalice to him. And the inscription was this. I have the honour, on behalf of headquarters, of presenting you with the cup for the one who has had the greatest success in resisting temptation. Subtle. The demon really does hate us, and that subtleness is at work until the end of time until he's taken in, taken in, the brilliant and the powerful, as well as those that he's already got. You know where his starting point was? He saw his brilliance, it was therefore pride. Every time we see pride, we see a trace of him. This Gospel is about pride. It's a very vivid picture and in its technicolour shows well the comedy of man. Is it or is it not true that we tend to claim the first place? Obviously indirectly, for pride, when it's true, is very good at camouflaging itself. Let's see some of its outworkings, the traces thereof. A person who talks a lot. A person, therefore, who is centre stage in any conversation. A person who will do anything and at any cost to get success in everything that he is doing. A person who is so engrossed in his own ideas that he has nothing to learn and therefore will spend each conversation teaching others. Do you know that some people actually, in the course of the Ministry of Reconciliation, Confession, spend some of their, or much of their confessions, giving instructions indirectly to the priest? Humility chooses the last place. What is the last place? It's not actually that of the weakling, because if one looks around, a person who has enough control of his moods and tongue as not to react in the same tone, even though apparently he's allowing himself to be conquered and won, is far more powerful in the long term. The person who is able, when in front of a person who is pulling him down, to be in total self-possession in such a way that he does not stoop to the level of the person at it, has his hidden glory. If we want our glory immediately, then we're proud. And an immediate litmus test is this. Somebody comes at us 
and has something to tell us, which directly or indirectly is an accusation. If we're honest, what will we do? Immediately we'll reach for our self-defense and justification, indicating that that person's word is important to us. We insist upon our glory. But I want to go to another domain. It's that of pride in career. Imagine a person who spends all his professional existence getting there. He may never get there actually and is condemning himself to being frustrated. Compare that with a person who is Content with the moment as it presents itself. Who has fulfillment? But bring that to another sphere and it becomes sinister. Ecclesiastical career. I heard this one time. It was a retreat being given to ordinaries before ordination. And the retreat giver, towards the end of the retreat, concluded with words of this order. Now, boys, you must decide. What do you want to be? A priest or a bishop? It was subtle, but profoundly accurate career. In the Canterbury Tales, the one who comes out most gloriously is the poor parson of a town. Thin as a rake, given to his flock. This is what the Lord wants at ordination. And I remember in the course given to us before ordination and before hearing confessions in the Vatican and the penitentiary, one of the last things that was told us was this. Remember this, young men. From the moment you feel the bishop's hands on your head, you will never, ever refuse to receive a person's confession. That's the priesthood. Sacrifice. Hiddenness. And if now what could be given only to priests is handed over to lay people, e.g. massively farming out the distribution of Holy Communion in hospitals and old people's homes to lay people who cannot confess, who has won? If, by now, many a priest is a managerial expert in the office, handing over the priestly role to lay people while he handles bits of paper and screens, who has won? If, then, we find a system in which only a certain type will get through the rungs to the highest places, excluding those who perhaps, like the poor parson of a town of Chaucer, are the real thing. Who has won? I know, actually, on the grapevine, the kind of thing that goes on at the choice of bishops sometimes. I picked it up from reliable sources. And this kind of scenario has been going on quite a bit. It's what is called bishops appointing bishops. It's called the magic circle. In the period after the council, it was politically correct to have a certain type of bishop. The same was true in many a seminary as regards ordinance. Therefore, 
For a generation, the type of bishop in many an area that we had was of the dismantling generation. What the French would call les 68 heures, those of 68. Those who had seen the light and rejected all the past. Demolition. The ecclesiastical demolition squad. Then, of course, what happens? As time goes on, those who have not known that phenomenon of rejection, because they've not come from anything to reject, see the beauty of what has been lost, that they've not known, and want to recuperate it. It happened in France, it's happening in parts of England, it's happening in parts of Ireland. A certain type is coming for ordination from a classical family with a classical faith interested in the sacred. It is difficult for them to get ordained quite often. It's not what they're looking for. They want the managerial style. What happens? Both in the seminary and in the choice of bishops, the very ones who by now are in the fullness of age and control are still there and making it difficult for them. And it's still happening that whereas people write and make appeals to the nuncio here and there, indicating what they know to be the kind of priest they want, and they'll give names. The nuncio takes note and is open. And then what happens? It goes back to the outgoing bishop, who has an extremely important role of discernment at that point, and is able to block because he's the one who knows the area and the needs officially. And so it goes on. And those who might be the very ones who could do something about cleaning up the mess are discarded, while more of the same thing is given and goes on. But that is worse. The good are attacked head on by Satan himself. This time, not just by a secondary means of the people, but by the means he has. The best, therefore the most noisome unto him, are the most keenly aimed at, with accuracy and precision, aiming at the very chink in which he can get a foothold and go in and conquer. In Italy, one of my closest friends in the monastery, spiritually, was the one with whom I was to be ordained. At the last minute they separated us by a few months so that I could be kept a little bit longer deacon, acquire better Italian and be useful as a deacon for high mass. But we thought we were going to be ordained on the same day, and he wrote to me this note, we'll say this, Novena, perpetual novena, until we're ordained. It was what he typed out, the various saints to be invoked, and a clear prayer to be faithful priests until the end. And we did so. When he was ordained, I was right next to him because I was deacon, and I felt the spirit passing. I was deeply moved. And that night I asked him to hear my confession, so he gave the first absolution to me. A few months later I was ordained. He was the Grand Chanter with another one, and it was beautiful. And that night, before the Blessed, no, before the Blessed Virgin, after Compline, he snugged up to me as we knelt before her for the rosary in private and said, would you hear my confession? So I gave the first absolution to him. This week, I made a lightning visit to Italy, there and back in one day, because he, who by then was an exorcist appointed by the bishop, high-powered study in Rome, able to give lectures in seminary and elsewhere, had got involved 
with a relationship with a divorcee and a child was on the way. And having sung the high mass on the 15th of August in the monastery, left a few messages here and there and slipped away. And since then, probably, the community would have to abandon ship. Old Nick is cleverer than we think, and we sleep happily and just play around with just a little bit of sin, which won't do any harm. Almost in tears, I wrote these words this week and hung them on to you. <laughs>